Good evening. David, have a seat. <laughs> Welcome to this evening's lecture on Parmigianino, which is being offered in conjunction with the recently opened exhibition, An Italian Journey, Drawings from the Toby Collection, Correggio to Tiepolo, on view in the galleries for drawings, prints, and photographs until August 15th. I'm Linda Wolk Simon, a curator in the Department of Drawings and the organizer of the exhibition and um, co author of the catalog. Our speaker tonight is David X. Surgeon, professor of the history of art and film at the University of Leicester, a position he's held since 2004. Prior to that, he was for many years the distinguished editor of Apollo magazine. David X. Surgeon is a renowned specialist in the field of 16th century Italian paintings and drawings, and his lengthy and impressive biography includes important monographs on Correggio and Parmigianino, as well as numerous articles on those artists and their contemporaries, and myriad other subjects. In addition to his impressive record as a scholar, Professor X. Surgeon is a member of the Reviewing Committee on the Export of Works of Art a trustee of the National Gallery and of the Tate in London, and a Leverhulme Trust Fellow. His most recent activities include organizing an exhibition called Treasures from Budapest, European Masterpieces from Leonardo to Schiele for the Royal Academy in London, opening in September of this year, and the preparation of a book on the altarpiece in Renaissance Italy, which is currently underway. In 2004, he was made an honorary citizen of the town of Correggio, and after hearing his talk tonight, Parmigianino's handwritings, I'm sure you'll agree that we should also make him an honorary citizen of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Please welcome David X. Surgeon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you, Linda, for that incredibly kind introduction. Um, I would love to be made an honorary um, citizen of the Metropolitan <laughs> Museum of Art because actually I was thinking as I wandered around this afternoon of a story that was told of the very eminent ancient historian Arnaldo Momigliano, who was supposedly asked, although he was a devout atheist, what his idea of heaven was. And he replied, the Bodleian Library in Oxford with central heating that works. <laughs> well, um, my idea of museum heaven and pretty much heaven is the Met. It's the museum I realize that I most adore, so I'm incredibly uh, delighted as well as honored to be here. Uh, and I'm also delighted that uh, I'm here, as it were, riding on the coattails of this magnificent Toby exhibition, uh, magnificent drawings uh, put together by the magnificent Tobys, David and Julie. Uh, so that's great too. Um, <clears throat> Linda mentioned the fact that I've written a book about Parmigianino and indeed articles about Parmigianino. Uh, and normally, um, I'm going to show you Parmigianino, by the way. So there he is, um, just so you see him. Uh, the self-portrait when he's a young man on the left and uh, uh, as an older man in the drawing on the right with uh, one of his greatest creations behind him. Um, <clears throat> as I was getting to the end of writing my book, I started to think about the subject of this lecture, but realized that I couldn't really do all the work and get it all kind of sorted out in time uh, before the book was published. So I, as it were, held it over. But there's something quite nice, I have to say, about the idea that when you finish the book, you haven't completely finished for all eternity with this artist whom you're interested in and love, but are allowed to have another go. And actually, I will also oh, show you that, uh, because uh, things do turn up. Uh, you know, you write your book and you finish your book, but that's not the end of discoveries of works by your artist necessarily. And uh, the drawing on the left uh, is a drawing by Parmigianino, which emerged after the publication of my book. Uh, it's a study for this print of Diogenes, which I will actually be discussing in the lecture proper. Okay, so that's the preamble, and now I'm going to get down to 
my text. I hope this will not uh, all be too kind of uh, tiresomely weighty, uh, but there's an element of Sherlock Holmes uh, about it, which I keep my fingers crossed that you will find uh, fun rather than uh, irksome. Okay. Even in the age of email, and although we take it pretty much for granted, we are all impressively adept at recognizing the handwriting of our nearest and dearest. In the same spirit, those historians of art, and in particular historians of drawing, who are still interested in issues of authorship and attribution, pride themselves on being able to identify what is often referred to as the handwriting of artists. In other words, their distinctive way of painting or drawing. It is the very opposite of by chance, therefore, that people talk about artists having a signature style. But it is also important to underline at the outset the fact that this concept is in no way incompatible with the other key aim of connoisseurship, namely the reconstruction of the stylistic evolution of individual artists over time. As it happens, if it is agreed that the history of art in the modern sense begins with Vasari's Lives of the Artists, then the idea that artistic style is as distinctive as handwriting is in a sense as old as the history of art. For in Vasari's L'autore agli artefici del disegno, the author to the uh, masters of design, we might say, he explains his method as involving a combination of written and visual sources. After acknowledging the use he has made of earlier writings on art, and referring specifically to the productions of Ghiberti, Domenico Ghirlandaio, and Raphael, he proceeds to discuss his study of actual works of art and the benefits of such study. What he has to say merits quotation in full. Uh, I have, nevertheless, always wanted to uh, compare or balance their words, what they've written, with seeing the works. For long practice teaches uh, painters to know, as you know, uh, not otherwise the various manners of masters, not otherwise than in the way that a learned uh, chancellor, which means somebody who writes uh, documents, knows the various writings of his uh, rivals or his, his group, and each one of us knows the characters, the letters of his closest friends and relations. We all recognize, as I said at the beginning, you know, if you get a letter through the post and it's from your aunt Flossie, you know from the way the address is written who sent it. Around a century earlier than Vasari was writing, on Monday the 14th of February, 1457, in connection with the saga of the decoration by Mantegna and others of the Ovatari Chapel in the Church of the Eremitani in Padua, a painter called Pietro da Milano testified concerning which of the frescoes were by Mantegna and already claimed to be able to identify the hand of the artist, and I quote again. And he said that he, the said witness, knows paintings by the hand of the said master Andrea Mantegna well. Uh, not that he, the said witness, saw him painting them, but out of long experience, which he has in this said art of painting. He's a very modest guy, but never mind. He knows that these paintings are by the hand of the said Master Andrea, and that among painters it is always known by whose hand any painting is, especially when it is by the hand of any established master. However, in spite of the long-established analogy between the two kinds of handwriting, there have been relatively few attempts to examine the actual handwriting of artists as a key to the understanding of the chronology of their works. Now, 
In fact, the main precedent for what I'm doing is Howard Burns's uh, exploitation of Palladio's handwriting for entirely comparable purposes. And I might say in a parenthesis that I didn't know when I was writing this that there was going to be a Palladio show at the Morgan, uh, which I saw this morning, but that was a pleasant uh, fluke. In the case of Palladio, the general appearance of his handwriting does not change dramatically over time, but he modifies the way he writes two specific letters, E and P, around 1547 to 51, and Burns has argued that these changes can be employed as aids to dating. These differences can be tracked both on drawings plausibly believed to be by Palladio, but also, and ultimately even more crucially, on other kinds of documents in his hand. Before the change, Palladio's E is a kind of version of the Greek epsilon, and his P has a more pronouncedly hooked tail. Given the virtual ubiquity of the word PAD for feet as a measurement, and even more its abbreviation P on his drawings, these clues prove to be exceptionally useful. And I should say that on the drawing on the left, you have the two handwritings uh, next to one another. Uh, my subject today, and I am finally kind of really getting there, is Parmigianino's writing in both senses. Uh, as its title implies, it is above all concerned with what I believe to be the three very different handwritings he used at different stages in his career. But it will also address the no less fascinating question of what he wrote and what that tells us about his cultural level and his intellectual concerns. Before addressing these questions in depth, however, it is necessary to set his activity against the wider context of his time. When it comes to Renaissance painters as opposed to architects, the relevant evidence is once again, above all, available on their drawings. The reason is not that no paintings are inscribed with painted handwriting. On the contrary, by the late 15th century, both signatures and other texts are on occasion rendered in a cursive script that counterfeits handwriting in paint. Rather, the problem is that the forms of the individual letters do not necessarily match up perfectly. Thus, if the calligraphy of the signature on Mantegna's Travulzio Madonna of 1497, that's on the left, is compared with an autograph letter written by the artist Isabella d'Este in 1506, the form of his name, Mantinia, is identical, but the tail of the letter G, just to take an example, uh, is open in the former, sorry, what am I on about? <laughs> well, yeah, the G of Augusti and the G in the letter, not in his name, just to make that point, is open in the former and closed in the latter. The most uh, extensive investigation of this issue, above all in connection with the artist in question's signature, occurs in an article of 2008 by Deborah Pincus about Giovanni Bellini. Pincus is above all concerned with Bellini's italic signature. And we're getting on to Bellini. <coughs> and, as her title uh, indicates to us, with its relationship with the practice of the humanist and scholar Pietro Bembo, after whom Typeface is named, and the great publisher Aldous <coughs> Minutius. Here, too, the signatures on the pictures are not the same as their pen on paper counterparts, although it is worth noting in passing that the example of the latter, which is illustrated, dates from 1470. That's the written document at the top. Uh, which is decades before the painted examples, which are on much later pictures from after 1500. The same sorts of anomalies appear to arise with Lorenzo Lotto, who on occasion signed paintings in a cursive hand and whose habitual handwriting is extensively preserved in his account book. By contrast, for obvious reasons, any handwriting on drawings 
should be no different from the handwriting found on any other pieces of paper or parchment. In the first half of the 15th century, the challenge is to find enough drawings potentially by a single artist with writing on them to be able to start to look for changes of handwriting. Uh, a letter of the 20th of July, 1457, written by Fra Filippo Lippi to Giovanni de' Medici, includes a quick sketch of a triptych, and there are other documents in the artist's hand, but sadly there are no other drawings associated with him which bear inscriptions that could conceivably be his. Nope. Sorry, there's the detail of the drawing. Uh, what is more, the far larger corpus of drawings by or attributed to his son, Filippino Lippi, are almost equally unadorned. In fact, the habit of routinely writing on drawings seems to have been one of the numberless innovations of Leonardo da Vinci, <laughs> seen here. Not only is he the first Italian artist whose drawings are extensively inscribed, but moreover, the fact that he employs mirror writing only accentuates the uniqueness of his handwriting. Thereafter, others followed his example and wrote on their drawings. Sorry. Okay. Not least among them, Raphael here and Michelangelo. For all that in the 16th century, the practice was far from universal as the example of an extremely prolific draftsman such as Fra Bartolomeo, who conversely almost never writes on his drawings, demonstrates. But just in case you thought I didn't know he did occasionally, I'm showing you that he does. Like Fra Bartolomeo, Parmigianino, literally the little Parmesan, whose real name was Francesco Mazzola, this will be relevant, and who never referred to himself by the nickname Parmigianino, that has come to stand in its stead, was an unusually prolific draftsman. And there is a considerable degree of general agreement, both concerning the nature and extent of his corpus of drawings, and concerning the broad contours of their chronology. This is hardly surprising in view of the fact that his career, from his birth in 1503 to his death in 1540, is basically well documented, not least thanks to Vasari's generally reliable biography, and is conveniently divided into a first period in Parma until 1524, period in Rome up to the sack of Rome in 1527, a period in Bologna from 1527 to 3031, second period in Parma, 1531 to 39, and a final very brief period in a place called Casal Maggiore, 1539 to 1540. So you have all these different periods. In consequence, there's no particular reason to anticipate that an analysis of the autograph inscriptions on Parmigianino's drawings will result in a radical revision of the status quo concerning their broad chronology. On the contrary, it is likely to confirm the established position from a wholly different perspective, but that of itself would be extremely instructive. It may also serve as a caution against ambitions to be over-exact when it comes to dating individual sheets. The number of extant documents, archival documents, in Parmigianino's hand is exiguous, and, as will become apparent, None can be associated with what seems to be the second of Parmigianino's three handwritings. Fortunately, however, uh, one is securely tied to his early years in Parma. This. On the 21st of November, 1522, Parmigianino wrote out and signed an autograph agreement with the authorities in charge of Parma Cathedral in which he promised to execute various frescoes in its north transept. In the event he failed to do so, uh, quite usual for him, either before his departure for Rome in 1524, or indeed after his return to Parma around the beginning of the 1530s. But the text of the agreement is well known and has been published on numerous occasions. What has not previously been reproduced, however, is the original document, which is now in the Archivio di Stato in Parma. 
In a memorable passage, Vasari claimed that the infant Parmigianino was instinctively attracted to drawing when he was meant to be learning to write, and that his teacher recognized his calling. As soon as he had a pen in his hand to learn to write, he began, pushed by nature, uh, which had made him born to draw, to make wonderful things in that line. And his teacher, who was teaching him how to write, uh, spotted this and persuaded his uncles um, <coughs> that they should um, get him to spend all his time drawing and painting. Regardless of the truth or otherwise of this account, a boy whose late father was a painter and who had two uncles and an elder brother who were painters as well would presumably have been pointed in the direction of drawing and painting anyway. The Duomo document reveals that Parmigianino wrote a bold and flowing hand at that point. Does this handwriting appear on any drawings by Parmigianino? And if so, when do they seem to have been executed? The note of caution indicated by the word seem is vital in this context for two reasons. The first is that even drawings connected with known projects may predate them quite significantly since artists must often have worked on commissions long before they signed contracts for them or started to paint. The second is that the writing on drawings need not invariably be of the same date as them, although, given the cost of paper, prima facie, it is unlikely to precede any drawing. As it happens, there is one and only one drawing by Parmigianino which is definitely inscribed with this handwriting. A sheet in the British Museum in London, on the right here, with studies of Putti, customarily <coughs> and no doubt rightly, connected with the artist's frescoes at Fontanellato, in their turn universally agreed to date from towards the end of his first period in Parma. In 1967, A. E. Popham, in his catalogue of 16th century drawings from Parma in the British Museum, almost gleefully dismissed the writing on this sheet. Quote, the writing is irrelevant. The lower writing consists of pen trials and the writing above does not seem to be in Parmigianino's hand. By 1971, in his great catalogue resume of Parmigianino's drawings, this had been toned down to become the lower writing in Parmigianino's hand consists of pen trials. That above is not by him. Achim Gnan, in his mighty two-volume corpus, recent corpus on the drawings, uh, simply concurs with this analysis. However, what Popham referred to as pen trials are rather more than that. Evidently heavily cropped at the left margin, they consist of seven lines, of which the bottom four include a number of words written in Latin. Conversely, the even more fragmentary upper lines are in the vernacular in Italian and appear to end with martir and fartir, farti morire, martyr and make you die, which strongly suggests that they belong to a rhyming couplet from some species of sub Petrarchan love lyric. Thus far, it has not proved possible to identify the source of either. But in view of the fact that Latinity was by no means a universal accomplishment of Renaissance artists, the content of these inscriptions is far from uninteresting. Parmigianino's second handwriting, which you see below, is both less spontaneous and more classical in appearance than the calligraphy it supplanted. Um, it basically represents a version of the hand referred to uh, by Pincus as the Cancellaresca Corsiva, or the Corsiva, which was used in the Papal Chancery and then rapidly caught on all over Italy. One of its most obviously striking features is that it is basically not joined up. The individual letters are close together, but in the main they stand in splendid isolation. It would appear that Parmigianino took a very conscious decision to modify his calligraphy at this juncture. He might obviously have done this in a number of ways, but one possibility that merits particular consideration is that he had recourse to a handwriting man manual. And the one I'm showing you on the left is by somebody called Sigismondo uh, Mondo Fanti. It was first published in Venice in 1514. Another option would have been to imitate the corsivo hand found in printed books, such as the Aldine uh, 
books like the Petrarch, and you see a bit of the old Dan Petrarch on the right. Uh, in neither case, however, is every single letter identical, but this need not come as no particular surprise. An individual's handwriting, then as now, is almost invariably the bastard offspring of a marriage between emulation and idiosyncrasy. This second handwriting appears on nearly 20 sheets, the earliest of which are securely associated with the artist's first period in Palma. So, um, <clears throat> the one it makes sense to begin by considering is another very closely related study of Putti in Berlin. Uh, in this instance, the writing on the stuck-down reverse gives every indication of being in Parmigianino's hand. The wonders of modern technology allow one to darken the overall tonality, invert the sheet, since the extensive writing on the verso is upside down in relation to the figure study on the recto, and then flip the image, all of which makes the writing rather more legible. I think you, I hope you can see that there's kind of ghostly writing there that is the same, but it's still basically indecipherable. Happily, the uh, reverse of a double-sided sheet, you see the front and the back of it here, with a study for Parmigianino's fresco of St. Agatha, uh, which is also generally dated towards the end of Parmigianino's first period in Parma, is considerably less impenetrable. It, too, gives every indication of including snatches of poetry, with such phrases as alpestri e duri, sort of rocky and hard, uh, whose source once again remains elusive. And now, here we are. Another double-sided sheet, this time in the Toby collection in New York, and of course in the exhibition, which in this instance is definitely connected both with the decorations at Fontinellato and with Parmigianino's portrait of their patron, Galeazzo Sanvitale, includes various specimens of Parmigianino's handwriting. As my colleague Mary Vaccaro was the first to demonstrate, the words uh, amor quando fioriva, love when it flowered, when it blossomed, are the opening of one of Petrarch's Rime Spouse, they're at sort of bottom left, um, which turns out to be a source the artist explored on at least one other occasion. Now, here are two bits which were once parts of the same drawing. Uh, they've been snipped apart, but you can see examples of this same uh, handwriting there. Uh, not very easy to decipher them, actually. Uh, and we do a bit better here, I think. Uh, the single word pudicizia, modesty, uh, on the reverse of this beautiful double-sided sheet in Würzburg is clear enough and easy to read. Uh, the dating of this drawing to the artist's first period in Parma is probably correct, but it has to be admitted that there can be no absolute certainty in such a context, not least since even a major geographical displacement, like the artist's move to Rome, cannot have resulted in an instant stylistic transformation. In the case of what must be a small fragment of yet another once larger sheet, the damage may have been done at a time when the reverse was not visible, the reverse on the right. Uh, be that as it may, the consequence is that only the first few letters of the four-line inscription are not cropped at the paper's right margin, but it is tempting to wonder if they too were not, as has already been proposed, lines of verse. On the basis of the style of the female head, it seems reasonable to place this sheet at much the same moment as the one in Würzburg I've just shown you. Uh, a minute fragment of writing here in a different hand above could just conceivably be Parmigianino's first hand, but ultimately I think there's too little of it left to come to a firm conclusion. A number of other drawings are adorned with this same handwriting. Here's one uh, in the Louvre. You can see the handwriting as I've twisted the drawing around at the bottom right hand corner. 
This is actually a, a, an unpublished drawing. It's on the website of the Réunion des Musées Nationaux, but it doesn't seem to be published anywhere else. Um, and here's another one in Bayonne, also in France, where, as you can see, there are alphabet tests uh, at the top, which look decidedly inept, whereas the three fragments lower down uh, are in the artist's second hand. And there's a text that seems to say something like primo quia non. Uh, yet another reverse of a double-sided drawing includes two words in the same hand, which have been read as il moro, the more. Uh, which may be what it says and has the merit of making sense. Um, uh, I think I jumped, sorry. Yes. A fourth inscription in the same hand is found on the reverse of the double sided cheek in Lille. Uh, and here, as you can see, both sides of the sheet are also quite extensively dotted with numbers. And these two must surely have been inscribed by Parmigianino. And indeed, extremely similar numbers, accompanied by the same sorts of squiggles, are found on the reverse of a double-sided sheet in Angers, which is what you see on the right. Somewhat in the same vein, um, a, the right, the main side of a double-sided sheet in a private collection you see here, combines indecipherable fragmentary textual inscriptions uh, with musical notation, which gives every indication of having been added by Parmigianino. This is complemented by the extensive writing on the reverse of a double-sided sheet with a holy family on its recto, in the collection of Jean Bonnat, which comprises a number of musical sequences in do re mi notation written out in words. The idea that Parmigianino, of all people, may have been able to read music is eminently plausible since he played the lute. His prowess is recorded by Vasari towards the end of his life of the artist, while in Vasari's biography of Giovanni Antonio Lappoli, he adds the information that he practiced with his friend Parmigianino during the latter's years in Rome. Even more interesting is the inscription here on the left, Dat Senior Lectos Juvenes Fortissima Corda, upon a wonderful landscape drawing in Florence. For a start, it is unusually extensive, but more importantly, it is a quotation Book 5, line 729 of the Aeneid. Oddly enough, however, it is neither exactly one of the epic's most famous lines, nor is it wholly self-contained, at least according to the modern reading, since the words dat senior at the beginning conclude the previous clause, while the rest of the line leads on to what follows. It is just possible, nevertheless, that by substituting a comma for a semicolon after senior, Parmigianino intended to recast it as a single standalone sentiment, which might be translated as the older man gives choice young men the strongest hearts. Even were this not to be the case, the quotation proves both that Parmigianino's interest in poetry was not confined to Italian and also that his understanding of Latin was not simply limited to the odd word. This presumption is supported by the existence of a pen drawing uh, representing an anatomical <coughs> study of a male nude uh, on the left here, which bears the words partes tres usque ad medium coli, uh, three parts up to the middle of the neck, and where, as also on the other drawing, on the right, the human figure is lined off into sections. Only in the first sheet, however, is the figure that subject to two distinct proportional systems. One of these divides the figure into ten equal parts and is related to the Vitruvian canon of proportion. 
So we might assume that he's uh, thinking about Vitruvius, but perhaps more importantly, since the words seem to represent a note made by the artist for himself, as opposed to a quotation from some earlier authority on human proportion, the fact that they're in Latin would indicate that Parmigianino's grasp of the language was active and not merely passive. A proportional study in Parma, the one on the left, is a rarity in another significant respect. In it, text and image are incontrovertibly related to one another. This is equally the case in a drawing in the Uffizi, which consists of a number of detailed preliminary studies for the hands, arms, and legs for the figure of Diogenes uh, in the print which I've already shown you. Uh, neither the sequence of execution of the prints nor this sheet's exact relationship to them, because there are two prints, is straightforward. But in the present context, the crucial point is that the drawing shows a pair of dividers and a sheet of paper covered with various lines which a right hand is measuring, together with the single word geometria. So clearly there is a link there. As stated above, the first appearance of Parmigianino's second hand, alongside his first hand, is on a sheet that is connected with the frescoes the artist executed in Fontanellato towards the end of his first period in Parma, around 1523-24. No legal or other independently dated document is written in this hand. All the subsequent appearances of the second hand seem to date from the first Parmesan, Roman, or Bolognese periods, although it is worth adding that none of the relevant drawings, rather annoyingly, definitely dates from after the sack of Rome and Parmigianino's flight north. On the 10th of May, 1531, Parmigianino contracted to fresco the east vault and main apse of the Church of Santa Maria della Staccata in Parma. In the middle of the legal contract drawn up by the notary, Benedetto del Bono, there is a reference to uh, his agreement with the authorities and to the fact that he's going to tell us uh, what he has to do. At this point, a page of detailed conditions, this is what you're seeing, written almost entirely in the artist's hand, but with some subsequent additions in a different, less formal hand, is inserted in the document. The fact that this is an autograph declaration is demonstrated uh, by its beginning with the words Io, I, Francesco Mazzolo, Pittore. I, Francesco Mazzolo, the painter. But any conceivable doubt uh, is allayed by the reappearance of this hand, the third hand, on a number of drawings by the artist associated with the productions of his final decade. There is the staccata. You get a bit of art as a bonus. <laughs> but only very little, I'm afraid. <coughs> First and foremost, it is found, this hand, on various drawings connected with the staccata itself. Thus, alongside studies for Daniel in the Lion's Den, uh, on the reverse of a double-sided sheet in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which you see here, is the artist's hitherto unrecognized signature in Latin, Franciscus Mausolus, at the top. Then again, it features on three scraps cut from what must originally have been a larger sheet or sheets, respectively inscribed Jacob, Jacob, and La Avarizia, the avarice. Um, I'm showing you two out of the three. Altogether, more extensively inscribed is an extremely impressive double-sided sheet in Modena. The text on its recto reads Querza Laura Palma Rose, uh, uh, Oak Laurel Palm Roses, while those on its verso read Nova Scienza in Abito Gentile Volse il mio cuore all'amorosa schiera, and something that's a bit harder to read. All the plants in the list on the recto, with the exception of the oak, are commonly associated with the Virgin. But perhaps more importantly, they all feature in the actual decoration alongside a veritable cornucopia of other fruit and vegetables. 
and indeed the drawing itself actually includes a pair of acorns. Turning to the inscriptions on the verso, um, as I said, the latter remains opaque, but as was brilliantly demonstrated by Mary Vaccaro again, the two lines of verse, new science in a gentle uh, costume turned my heart to the loving group of people, and you see it there at top right, perhaps the best. Um, <clears throat> this text also comes from Petrarch, and it comes uh, from a poem of some considerable obscurity because it's not actually included in Petrarch's own edition of his works. In all, three further drawings are inscribed with this third hand. The first is a double-sided sheet in Stockholm with four studies for the torso of the Virgin in the artist's Madonna of the Long Neck and a cancelled but perfectly legible sequence of Latin words with their Italian translations on the verso. Yes. Then there's this, which is um, <coughs> also inscribed with the same hand. It's an annunciation which a lot of people think is by him. I actually think, which is slightly confusing, is it's a copy of a lost drawing by him in which somebody's also copied his handwriting. Uh, but you might not want to believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally... We have this, the front and the back again. Um, it's uh, an inscription on the reverse of the study of four female heads, which you see, and it reads 1537 a 22 a 22 di And then bre should be there. Io dete due scudi d'oro a Messer Damiano. Uh, on the 22nd of December 1537, I gave two gold scudi to... Uh, Mr. Damiano, to Sir Damiano. And as has been pointed out, this Damiano is Damiano de Pleta, who was involved with the commission for the painting of the Madonna of the Long Neck. He seems to have been adapting the chapel. He was an architect. And he also joined forces with Parmigianino's great patron, the Cavaliere Francesco Baiardi, to stand surety for Parmigianino in connection with the staccato frescoes because Parmigianino was very slow moving and he eventually got chucked into jail uh, but that as they say is another story there remains one final document that bears Parmigianino's handwriting in which I believe needs to be examined with considerable care not simply taken for granted uh, this is the celebrated letter the artist wrote to Giulio Romano from Casal Maggiore on the 4th of April, 1540, just a few months before his death on the 24th of August of the same year. That's the document you see on the right. The calligraphy of its signature, Francesco, well, it's Frank, but it's an abbreviation of Francesco, uh, Mausolo, accords perfectly with the hand found on the staccata um, agreements, which you see on the left. But the text of the letter itself is strikingly different, not only from that document, but also from the other examples of Parmigianino's third hand. This is apparent both when the detail of the individual letters of the alphabet common to both is examined, and I can spare you that, but I promise you I've done it, but also, and arguably even more tellingly, when the spacing of the letters within words and the spacing of the words themselves is compared. For one of the features of the artist's third hand is how closely spaced it is, and the obvious conclusion must be that Parmigianino, in the letter, like many another in his time, availed himself of an amanuensis, very possibly one of the entourage of acolytes referred to in his will, and in a letter of the 11th of May, 1540, from Giulio Romano, the painter and, and architect, to the authorities at the Staccata. Indeed, the reason why Parmigianino's letter to Giulio, which you see on the right, is preserved in the archive of the Staccata is precisely because it was forwarded by Giulio. 
together with his covering letter, in which he explained that Parmigianino's uh, missive had been delivered in person by, and I'm going to do it in Italian, and I promise you I'll translate it, but people who know Italian might like this, un giovane sbarbato, molto arrogante, <laughs> con una gran chiacchiera, e parlava per geroglifici, e molto devota del detto Messer Francesco, which means a beardless youth who was extremely arrogant and had a lot of, well, we'd say a lot of lip in English, 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 I don't know whether you say that, a lot of, a lot of gift of the gab. And he spoke in hieroglyphs, in gobbledygook, and he was utterly devoted to the said uh, Francesco. In terms of its um, calligraphic style, the most important observation to make about this third and final hand is that it is more formal than the other two, and yet considerably more fluent than its immediate pr predecessor, number two. It is another form of chancery hand, and it seems reasonable to presume as has already been proposed in connection with the transformation from his first to his second hand, that Parmigianino once again took a very conscious decision to modify his calligraphy. He might obviously have done this in a number of ways, but one possibility that merits particular consideration, even more for this third hand than for the second, is that he had recourse to a handwriting manual. There were a number of books of this kind in circulation, but incomparably the most likely to have attracted the attention of Parmigianino were two volumes published in Rome, La Operina da Imparare di Scrivere Littera Cancellaresca, the little work to learn how to write the chancery letters of 1522, and the Tesauro dei Scrittori, the Treasury of Writers, which went through various editions, but was first published in 1525. Uh, the reason why this is the likely source is very simple. Both were projects involving Ugo da Capi, whose superb chiaroscuro woodcut of Diogenes, which you see on the right, was based upon a design by Parmigianino. So, on the left is the engraving by Caraglio. On the right, the other version in a chiaroscuro woodcut by uh, Ugo da Capi. As I have argued elsewhere, although the date of this print, the, the woodcut, has been much debated, Ugo must have already uh, been a close associate of the artist in Rome since his extraordinary brushless painting uh, Come on. brushless because done with his hand, with his fingers uh, his extraordinary brushless painting which you see on the right of Saint Veronica with the Studerium between Saints Peter and Paul which was executed for St. Peter's, probably in connection with the Jubilee of 1525, is directly based upon a drawing by Parmigianino, which you see on the left. And by way of parenthesis, I cannot resist telling you that uh, according to Vasari, when Michelangelo was told that the Ugo de Capi was done without the use of brushes, he said something to the effect that it bloody well looked like it too, because it was so awful. <laughs> Um, and I'm certainly not claiming that that is the highest masterpiece you will ever have the pleasure of looking at. But it does show that uh, Ugo da Capi and Parmigianino were mates in 1525 or so. <coughs> now, to return to the handwriting book. The Operina, the first of the two books, was written by somebody called Arrighi, also called Ludovico Vicentino. But the woodcuts for both the text and the illustrations were the work of Ugo because they made the letters of the pages of the uh, um, writing in the form of a wood cut. Furthermore, as, it, as is explained by somebody called Esther Potter in her introduction to a modern facsimile of a 1535 edition of this anthology, the Tesauro, it is an anthology of extracts actually from three sources, all of which were first published in Venice. They are Sigismondo Fanti's 
aforementioned Theorica et Pratica, 1514, that's the one I showed you a page of, a book called Il Modo di Temperare le Penne by Arrighi of 1523, and Giovanni Antonio Taliente's even more descriptively titled Lo Presente Libro Insegna la Vera Arte dello Eccellente Scrivere de Diverse Varie Sorte di Lettere of 1524. Uh, this man had a bit of a problem with uh, what we would think of as a title, and he called his book, The Present Book Teaches the True Art of the Excellent Writing of Different and Various Sorts of Letters. Anyway, within the pages of all of these are a number of variants on the chancery hand, which closely resemble Parmigianino's third and final hand, and I'm just going to buzz through them. So in each case, you get side by side. No single one of these is absolutely identical to the third hand, but given the close working relationship between Ugo and Parmigianino, it seems inconceivable that the latter would not have been aware of these enterprises and this book. If anything, what is perhaps surprising if I'm right, is how long it took him to switch handwritings for the second time. Because the first we know of it is not in 1525 or so, but in 1531. But one possible explanation may precisely be the fact that his second handwriting was still a novelty at the time of his move to Rome. In other words, having just mastered what he thought was a very kind of smart way of doing it, he didn't want to abandon it uh, instantly. <clears throat> By way of completeness, it is important to make one final point that has already <coughs> been mentioned in passing, um, <coughs> and that is that we should also look a bit. Well, I don't know that I have mentioned it properly, but we should look at we should look at capitals. Uh, here you can see three drawings which also have capital letters. Uh, the one on the left, Natore Ars Emula, art, uh, the emulator, the imitator of nature, uh, which is a tag from the golden ass, Vapuleus, uh, a wonderful drawing for a knife, liberalita, liberality, in the middle, and a bit of an inscription saying endymion on the, um, on the right. And that also can clearly be studied in some detail. But this is the other point. Parmigianino's drawings, like those of any Renaissance artist, have routinely been written on and stamped with collector's marks of ownership down the centuries. Some of these inscriptions may very possibly date from his lifetime. And if successful, then the attempt to define the three hands identified by me is bound to suggest that other hands are not the artists and may potentially cast doubt upon the authorship of the drawings they accompany. So the drawing on the left is, I think, generally currently believed to be by Parmigianino. I certainly used to think, before I went into it, that the hand was the second hand, but I'm getting a bit less sure. Uh, the drawing on the right is a drawing which I hope I'm going to have the pleasure of seeing for the first time in the original tomorrow at Princeton. And the handwriting there, I think, has uh, more of a claim. Interestingly, in this case, it's the drawing that has not traditionally been given to Parmigianino. Uh, and here's another one, the drawing on the left. I'm sorry, it's incredibly tiny, but it has a little date on it from the late 1530s, 1538. But if you compare that handwriting with the handwriting on the um, one on the right, then I don't think that handwriting is Parmigianino. So I don't know quite what that inscription means. There are a number of versions, I should say, of this um, lady, this satiress. 
Uh, I'm sure that Parmigianino made a drawing like that, but whether any of them is actually his drawing as opposed to a copy is a bit more complicated. And now we come to another tricky one which is the drawing on the right. Um, <coughs> the handwriting here has again been claimed as Parmigianino's, and it's been used to say that the drawing is by him. The main drawing on the front of the sheet, which I'm actually not showing you, is of a Madonna and Child, um, which is now in, in Edinburgh, in the National Gallery of Scotland, and uh, that Madonna and Child was traditionally thought to be by Parmigianino's cousin uh, by marriage, Girolamo Mazzola Bedoli. Um, more recently, Sir Timothy Clifford, in particular, who bought this drawing for Scotland, has championed the idea that it is indeed by Parmigianino, and he's contended that the handwriting gives additional support to this hypothesis. Uh, in my opinion, it actually does precisely the opposite. And I believe the attribution to Baderley to be the right one. Although I have to admit, I have yet to track down an inscription in Baderley's hand in order to compare them. That's obviously what I should try and succeed in doing. <coughs> to conclude, I would like to sound a final further note of caution. Obviously, I would not have presented this material if I were not convinced of the basic soundness of my arguments. But, as with the handwriting of drawings, so actual handwriting needs to be examined with immense care. And I'm not, and do not claim to be, a paleographer. Shakespeare, who knew most things, also knew that it was possible to counterfeit handwriting. And I would like to leave the last word to him. In Twelfth Night, one of the many twists of the plot relies upon the fact that Malvolio recognize his recognizes his lady Olivia's hand in a letter. And in Act 2, Scene 5, he pronounces that these be her very C's, her U's and her T's, and thus make she her great P's. It is in contempt of question her hand. Then, in Act 3, Scene 4, he tells Olivia herself, I think we do know the sweet Roman hand. In reality, however, the letter has been written by Olivia's waiting gentlewoman, that's what she's called in the cast list, Maria, who, in Act 2, Scene 4, tells Sir Toby Belch, I can write very like my lady, your niece. On a forgotten matter, we can hardly make distinction of our hands. We have all been warned. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't know what the rules are, but if anybody wants to ask a question, possibly informally, I'm here.